Hello, everyone. Welcome into a bonus episode of the Four Quarters podcast powered by Four Quarters Media. I'm your host, Tyler Bennett, here with you once again. I call this a bonus episode, but we're labeling it as episode 30 in season two. Call it as you wish. If you want to call it a bonus, it's a bonus. If it's episode 30, it's episode 30. It is what it is. Right now, given the current situation with some seasons being canceled across the country, others still awaiting decisions in mid-November to mid-January. At this point, we're just committed to talking about the game at both the CCAA and U sports levels, both men's and women's alike, as much as possible to keep the game, its players, its coaches in the spotlight and on people's minds as much as possible. Because as we'll talk about in this episode, from March 2020 to potentially October 2021, we're not going to have games. So you're going to have an 18-month window with no games in the CCAA or U sports, potentially. That's going to be tough. That's going to be real tough. But I'm committed to discussing the game year-round all the way through until it returns and then keep it moving from there. But it is, it's going to be tough with no basketball. We'll see what we can do, but we'll have conversations. We'll have players, coaches, media, who knows who will be on this podcast or on the website between now and when games come back. Episode 30 is one of those episodes that kind of came together rather quickly. Short notice, we squeezed it, we fit it in. Bonus episode, and it's one of those ones again where keep the conversation going I was thrilled to be joined by Concordia University of Edmonton Thunder men's basketball head coach Reagan Wood on this episode just a fun chat overall a lot of great stories talked about his mentor Paul Sir who he played for was fortunate enough to get a call from to begin his coaching career with and then took over the Concordia program in 2012 following in the footsteps of Coach Sir. And he talked about the impact that Steve Sir has had on Reagan's career as well and looked at some of the big-time players that have come through the program over the last few years especially, uh, specifically Ryan McLaren, who you will find his name on pretty much every record or most records in the Thunder program history both single season and career. Ron Bacon Jr., another fantastic player who I haven't had the pleasure to meet yet, but just from what I've seen and what I've heard, has an infectious personality to go along with stellar play on the floor. So hearing Coach Wood share these stories on these players is really fun to hear and just shows the mutual respect that he has for his players and the players have for him and the opportunities that they were given over their careers. We took a trip down memory lane a bit and looked at the 2014 CCAA National Championships, which I think were one of the best, if not the best, national championship in recent years, to say the very least, given all of the excitement that came from that event from day one right through to the finals. We talked about that in length as well. Just all all in all, really fun. Really fun chat to have with Coach Wood looking at the Thunder and their success over the last eight years since he's taken over as head coach, kind of what got him into coaching in the first place, and kind of everything really – in between from 2007 when he got the call to coach with coach sir to now how they're dealing with the pandemic and the protocols yet are still able to be in the gym and kind of what that looks like and we really went from start to finish and everything in between 
So with that said, let's just jump right in to episode 30 slash bonus episode of the Four Quarters podcast powered by Four Quarters Media with myself and Concordia University of Edmonton Thunder men's basketball head coach, Reagan Wood. Enjoy. All right, so I'm now thrilled to be joined by Concordia University of Edmonton Thunder men's basketball head coach, Reagan Wood. Coach, I want to thank you for taking time to do this. I know we, we planned it on a bit of short notice. And like we said before we came on, it's a Saturday where it would be opening weekend. So now time is uh, just in abundance right now. But how are things uh, on your end at West? Oh, well, it's, it's starting to get that, uh, that fall feeling slash winter feeling uh, mm -hmm. in the air as it, uh, the temperatures dip out here, which means, uh, you know, in, in normal times, that would mean basketball season. Right. Uh, and so you're right. It would have been our, our opening weekend. And we would have been uh, – I believe the May Dukes would have been our opponent this week at uh, okay. Coach Slav and a good buddy of mine there, and uh, we uh, we miss being able to to be out on there uh, out on the court competing against each other. So mm -hmm. uh, no, no no problem finding the time, and and uh, again as we've talked about, I really appreciate what you do um, for all of us in the CCAA and in new sports, and bringing yeah. attention and taking time to uh, to uh, promote the game of basketball at the university level in our country so again thanks to you for uh, for making this possible well I, I appreciate that and like I'm the same with you like we talked before we came on like this would have been our second weekend out in Ontario and now I have a Saturday off that I don't know what to do with my life when it's not basketball games or the school it's second part-time job and both off on the same day it's kind of weird so with no basketball and now it's just, you don't know what to do with yourself anymore. Like you just kind of sit and stew and I don't know. I don't know what to do. It's weird. Yeah. Well, we got a little, we got a little college football on today too. So it's oh. like dive in, dive into some, dive into some college football. So <laughs> yeah. Who is, uh, who is your college team? Do you have a college team that you've, you know, well, I mean, I have my own team, but uh, that's, uh, that's just basketball. We obviously don't have football at, uh, mm -hmm. court, you know, but uh you no, know, I just enjoy uh, just enjoy a good game. Honestly, I haven't had uh, one particular school down in the states that uh, found a, a rooting interest in. Just uh, you know, it gets a little predictable. I think you end up with the same five or six teams that end up in that Final Four playoff every year. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mean, it's interesting to watch. Uh, you know, those power programs be able to repeat that success over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also fun to watch some of those smaller schools go in and, and challenge, uh, challenge those bigger schools and, and compete. And so, but yeah, no, I grew up, uh, grew up playing a lot of basketball, played football in high school and I love football as well. And mm -hmm. that's so always enjoy watching that too. I'm a, I just looked at the scores cause we're recording this now. It's a Saturday at uh, one Oh four Eastern time. And I am a diehard Michigan state fan. And right. we are we are down fourteen to Rutgers in the second quarter. That's probably not good. That's not, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> we came in as eleven point favorites, and we are down fourteen uh, twenty minutes into a game. So this is going to be a long, a long eight game season. <laughs> yes, and, yes, that's yeah. The Big Ten's only going eight, right? Right, and yeah, yeah we. I think as long as we beat Michigan, I don't care if we go one and seven. That's our one win. I don't. I, that's the, the that's all I want. Games. Well, I've got I, in the background. I've got on the Ohio State and Nebraska game, and a uh, quick family story. My cousin uh, Brooks, uh, his name is Brooks Blackburn, he was originally mm -hmm. from McGrath, Alberta. Mm -hmm. He went on a golf scholarship to Nebraska. He was okay. The best high school okay. and, and youth uh, golfer in Alberta when when we were growing up, we're the same age, and he. Uh, he went there on a full golf scholarship. So there's all, I always have a little bit of a love for the Cornhuskers, I guess mm -hmm. I could say, if you wanted to give something, you know, it's a uh, little family tie there. And I know my right. dad is still a big fan of, uh, of uh, Cornhuskers. So yeah. it's, it's always, yeah, so maybe, maybe we'll, maybe we'll say Nebraska for now. <laughs> okay. That's fair. It's always cool to hear how like people become associated or like fans of schools in the States that they have no, real connection to other than a family member or whatever else. And 
it's, I mean, there's so many schools down there too. There's like 357 division one schools that play basketball. Like it's, it's craziness. Like yeah. it's massive. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, yeah. It's, it, it makes what we look, I mean, again, obviously they have 10 times the population that we do. Mm. Mm-hmm. It seems like they have a hundred times the schools. So. Yeah. It, uh, yeah mm. you know, pretty impressive, pretty impressive what they do down there with, uh, with university sport. And then you add in Division Two, II, Division Three, Junior College, NAIA. Everybody's got a school. Like it's, it's insane. It's yeah, I don't yeah. Know. Anything that I could yeah. say has already been said on it. Like it's just massive. Yeah, yeah, and and, and you know what? It, it gives you know young people an opportunity to do something right. that is you know creates lifetime memories, lifetime friendships. And it's just, uh, yeah, no. So I, I support them doing it all. <laughs> 100%. Welcome to keep doing it. Oh, for sure. You yeah. mentioned, obviously, this being kind of your, what would have been opening weekend. You guys are still one of the more fortunate schools in Canada to actually still be in or be able to be in your gym. What's just, how, how good does it feel to just at least be in the gym when you see other parts of the country Ontario, us, um, not being allowed in the gym. How does that, how does that make you feel? Uh, it feels good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are, we are fortunate. We are lucky. We, we have had to put in a lot of work as coaches with our athletic department, our administration and our school to make sure that we had uh, a good plan in place that, you know, was approved at all levels and, mm-hmm. Um, fortunate to have a great group of people that that saw our way through this to to create that opportunity. It's not normal by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I can't even have all the guys in the gym together yet. Uh, okay. We're building towards that as part of a phased return um, mm-hmm. to, to being able to practice. Um, you know, once we hit November, we're supposed to be fairly normal. Okay. Uh, with our with our numbers, but. It, uh, you know, we're, we're grateful for what we have because, again, there are those who do not have it. And so I feel for them. And I know how hard the coaches and the players across the country work and prepare. And we're facing a situation that uh, none of us ever hoped, wanted, planned, prepared, thought we'd ever be in. No. And we just have to, to adapt and to make the best of it. And I think there's one thing that athletics and coaches and players can do well is those things because mm-hmm. that's a huge part of our job is to adapt to changing conditions, whether it's the opponent we're playing against, whether it's injuries, whatever it may be. And so this is one big injury that we're all dealing with that, that prevents us from playing. Right. And, um, you know, I, I right. hope that other, other uh, coaches and players get the opportunity sooner than later to, to get back out there. I know how valuable it's been to uh, the mental health and the physical health of our athletes and the coaches, quite frankly, um, mm-hmm. it's tough, uh, sitting at home mm-hmm. and, you know, you want to be safe. You want to be smart. You want to comply with the rules to keep others safe. Uh, but at the same time with athletes, you're dealing with a young, healthy subset of the population that I think can, not that we want anyone to get sick by any stretch, but, um, their ability to tolerate this risk is probably a little bit higher than those in other categories, you know, the elderly and people with uh, pre-existing conditions that may be negatively affected by COVID. And so I think the gym is a very safe place for these, these guys to be, these athletes to be uh, along with the coaches. Again, assuming that all the proper protocols are being followed. Uh, and so and I know that we're doing that and we're, we're very strict with it. And anytime someone doesn't have a mask on when they are supposed to have a mask on, we hear about it. And that's good mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. that means that we're taking these things seriously and that if we do things the right way, hopefully we can get more opportunities to, to be back on. Yeah. And I think there's always going to be little slip ups along the way. Like you mentioned, like a mask not being worn when supposed to be. And I think that, as long as you learn from that, it does become a habit. But I think a lot of these, like you said, the student athletes and coaches, like the gym is probably one of the safest places they can be because of the protocols. And if you give an athlete the opportunity to be in the gym, even with the protocols in place, I'm willing to bet that they're all going to want to follow it to a T because they don't want to be losing that privilege to be in a gym. 
because they yeah, for sure. want to be in there and they're going to follow those rules to the T if that means they can practice. Yeah, one one would hope that's the case, and I know with with my guys, and I can talk for for Coach Robbie with his girls as well that they're mm-hmm. doing all those things to, to make sure that that's the case. Yeah. Um, so it's yeah, you're right. It's you know, so, so again, control what you can control, and right now we have to control the the parameters that we're given, and work within them. And hey, if it means being on the court, I'm happy to work within them. Mm-hmm. You guys had your first kind of scrimmage this past week what was it like to have like yeah, a, bit so, of, a bit of game action at least <laughs> yeah so again in, in our in our return to play plans with you know phasing in how we even competed within practice was part of it mm-hmm. and so starting out with at least a lot of skill work and individual stuff and then smaller groups and you know modified small side games up to kind of three three on three type uh, drills and things that we were working on and so again yeah this is kind of the point of the first part of where we were able to go back to a bit more of that five on five type stuff. So uh, it was sloppy. (laughs) It was, uh, it was probably good. It wasn't opening weekend. If we, if we had been doing this and then had an actual opening weekend, uh, the turnovers may have been higher than the points, but uh, it, uh, it was, it was great. I know the guys were really looking forward to it when we told them that's what we were going to do for practice on Thursday. Mm -hmm. uh, You know, I've seen a few other programs around the country doing it as well. Having those inner spot things, and again, I think it's again, it's great for so many reasons, and uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I'm happy to say that the team that I drafted was the winner. Um, I let the, I let my assistants coach the uh, coach the teams during the game, and I just got to be the uh, be the observer. Okay. Um, but uh, but uh, we divided our staff. We we, we drafted um, uh, the teams, and then uh, yeah, happy to say that uh, my my half won. So. A little bit of trash talking amongst the coaches. Right. <laughs> that, well. That's all part of the fun. Like having when you have like a situation like this, and you are finally able to have some sense of normalcy, even though with the world is nowhere near normal. Just having that little extra fun, having the drafts, having your assistants, coaches, as coach the teams, like in the trash talk, it just makes it a lot more enjoyable than just you know here's a little six on six you know with one sub scrimmage make it a kind of a spectacle and have a little bit of extra fun to it as you go yeah Yeah, absolutely and that's and that's going to be it'll be a regular for us going forward so uh, and for you doing it and for you draft the immediate the the immediate message after yeah the immediate message after is when's the redraft (laughs) i said well i don't know if i want to redraft no uh, you got a winner. You got to build a winner. You want to keep it. So. I mean, you're showing showing your assistants kind of how it's done. You know, draft a winning team, the first draft in, and they can take some notes and uh, hopefully hopefully do better the second time around. Well, it was three three. We had two teams of coaches okay. that draft each draft a set of teams. So it's collective win, but uh, uh, I'll take I'll take the credit where I can. One hundred percent. If if you're given the opportunity, I would take the same credit. So I mean, yeah. it's. Absolutely. It is what it is. Looking kind of at your career, we've talked over the summer kind of about some of your mentors and whatnot. We'll get into that in a second. But when did you first realize that coaching was for you? So you mentioned you played a lot of basketball growing up, but when did you realize that, okay, I want to coach. This is what I want to do. You know, I, I, I dabbled with it a little bit, right? Um, Right after I was done playing, um, did a, a little bit of football, and then I coached my my brother's uh, community league team one okay. year. Like on regular, I was, you know, just just wrapping up playing days. And um, who you were as a coach back in those moments, where you're pretty much the same age as a lot of the players, and uh, in the football in particular, but uh, with basketball with some younger. Uh, some younger kids. My brother's uh, about five years younger than I am. And so mm-hmm. uh, coaching his community league team. And then, I, you know, I was away from it for a while, did some different things, uh, you know, between school and work and all kinds of different things. And, you know, just got a phone call one day uh, from a you know, former coach of mine and, and uh, Paul Sir and said, you know, would you be interested in coming and helping out? And 
and you know, just there was no master plan of any kind. It was like, hey, why don't you come out? We could use somebody to to chip in, and and I'd always felt that you know my the the brain was better than the body for me when it came to playing, and so I always approached the the sports in that way that I had to be sharp mentally as the guy who couldn't run faster than everybody or jump out of the gym. Mm -hmm. Any success I had as a player is because I had to outthink people. And so I think that kind of naturally led into, you know, coaching. And then, you know, you're in the, you're in the gym and you get back into it and you get into that rhythm again of remembering why you love the sport. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that first year just assisting uh, with Paul, you know, it just the fire lit. And here we are 14 years later. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it just, it, it happens. And again, sports has always been a huge part of my life. You look forward to one season to the next and mm -hmm. playing a variety of things, but basketball was always the uh, number one in, in the heart and in the mind. And, uh, you know, was fortunate to be given an opportunity to, uh, to learn and to be a part of a program and I think one of the keys too was not rushing it. It's not like after a year or two, I thought, oh yeah, I could take this over and, and be ready. I took five years to really learn, uh, learn the ropes. And even, even after that, it was still that first year where it's like, okay, this is all on you now. There was still a lot of, you know, uh, wide eyed moments of, oh, geez, that's, yeah, I got to deal with that. I've got to figure that out. I've got to, you know, you got to recruit, you got to fundraise, you got to plan, you got to prepare, you got to build your, you know, non-conference schedule. You've got like, all things that you had a, a hand in mm -hmm. a little bit as an assistant, but when it's finally all on you and then, you know, finding other, you know, other coaches to help you out as you were helping someone else out. And man, there's just so many responsibilities that come with uh, being a head coach. And so you're still, again, again, 14 years in still learning mm -hmm. um, how to do those things better and, and pushing towards building you know, the absolute best program that can. I think that's I think it's one big thing too, like you said, it's just you're always learning. And I think that's one thing that I think a lot of people can take in whatever job, industry, whatever it is they're in. And as soon as you I think get that mindset where you think you know everything, it's all downhill. Like you have set yourself up for disaster. And I think you saying that like it's always just a constant learning, I think that's a big thing that I think anybody who listens to this can take away and apply to whatever they are doing in their lives now and be like, okay, like there's always something new to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Cause again, it's let me know when the season I just played is going to be the same as the season that's coming up and I'll be really happy because you can just correct the mistakes you made and make different decisions, but it's never like that. The, the season's going to be different every year. Mm -hmm. Players you have, there's always going to be a few in a few out. There's always, you know, there's going to be an injury here. There's going to be an illness there. There's going to be some sort of travel issue. There's going to be, you know, there's going to be a million different things that can come your way. And so uh, assuming that it's going to be easy and fair and, mm -hmm. and go the way you want it to go, um, if you do that, you, you're going to end up on the wrong side of the score more often than, uh, than you want. Yeah. So being adaptable, being prepared um, and, and rolling with it is a big part of, trying to be successful with this you mentioned Paul sir and you were an assistant under him when you first started Concordia and then you took over in 2012 outside of him giving you that kind of first opportunity calling you up and said we have a spot for you what has he meant to your coaching career having worked under him and then now having taken over and kind of followed in his footsteps well, I mean, my, my, my history with, with Paul goes way, way back to when I was 10, 11 years old mm -hmm. and playing in one community league in Edmonton. And um, back when it was a little more, uh, I don't want to say taboo, but getting recruited to uh, go play for a different community league uh, within the city uh, and going over and, uh, and playing for him as a kid. And, and we, had, uh, we had a heck of a run there with the Otwell Community League. Uh, winning the youth provincial championships and undefeated seasons. And, okay. Uh, so I, again, I learned how to play. One of the, one of many good coaches that I had uh, growing up, but uh, but uh, some great times, uh, you know, running off an undefeated season and winning a provincial yeah. championship together, uh, and then uh, 
obviously his son Steve. I know you're familiar with Steve and mm-hmm. his many, many accomplishments in the game mm-hmm. of basketball. And uh, you know, obviously we're still friends to this day. And, and uh, you know, Steve with his 10-year professional career in five on five, and now on our national team for three x three, and yeah. all that you know, all that those guys are doing with that. And uh, you know, happy to and grateful to be a small part of it. And uh, and seeing how those guys are progressing. Uh, is awesome and so again again those lifelong connections but the yeah the 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 things I learned I really I mean I became a, a good shooter too because I learned from you know someone who was able to teach uh, their son how to become the best three-point shooter in NCAA history <laughs> so yeah. I think I picked up a thing or two on the on the shooting and uh, continued to, uh, to to pick Steve's brain about shooting uh, all the time and the great conversations that we have Mm-hmm. on and off the court about uh, about how to better teach players and what works, what doesn't work, um, you know, and I'll learn, continuing to learn from those who have uh, excelled at the game. And so, again, my that initial opportunity to play with Steve and for Paul when I was uh, when I was very young is, you know, again, we're talking 25 years later, still having a, a huge impact on on what I'm doing in the game. Mm-hmm. There's a story, you kind of mentioned it before when we, we did our Thank You Coaches Week and you sent me a picture with Dr. J mm-hmm. and his hands. <laughs> yeah. What's, uh, I mean, what's yeah. the story behind that? And one, so, where did you meet him, for one? And then two, the story behind how massive his hands are. Yeah, so we were uh, in Calgary. So the Raptors were doing their Western – Canadian exhibition game that they do every couple okay. of years. And it was in Calgary that year. Right. Uh, so along with coaching at Concordia, I also work for Alberta basketball. So I actually still work for Paul as he is our <laughs> executive director with Alberta basketball. Um, and so we, we were given the opportunity through kids sport uh, to go down to Calgary and work the 50 50 mm-hmm. uh, to, you know, support kids sport and to help fundraise for our program. So kind of a win-win for both, uh, for both groups. And so, took the guys down, loaded up the, the school van and drove the guys down to Calgary. And uh, we got there pretty early because we needed to be there to, to set up and prepare. And, mm-hmm. and we knew that uh, we knew that Dr. J was going to be that he was the kind of the NBA dignitary, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, him along with, uh, with uh, the junkyard dog, Jerome Williams. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. He was in town that week as well for that, uh, for that game. So it was Nuggets and Raptors. Uh, in Calgary at the Saddle Dome, and we were waiting outside, and all of the guys were getting antsy, and they're like, "Oh, coach, we're gonna run over, grab some lunch, uh, grab some food at McDonald's." And so I'm just like, "Oh, I'll just hang out, wait, you guys go grab some of the assistants." Everybody, everybody left, yeah. and uh, Paul texts me, he's like, "Hey, we'll come out to get you. We got Dr. J, you know, on the court early." And I was like, "I will be there." <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, got the uh, got the VIP pass, and so we're down there watching uh, the Raptors do their pregame work. Yeah. Uh, again, this is when you yeah, have you know, like a first year Pascal Siakam. Uh, okay. And they're so in there where they're really still figuring out where those guys fit. And, right. You know, and overcomes uh, you know, Dr. J. And again, he's all of, you know, that 6'8. And you get the handshake, and, you know, the fingers are going two or three inches up your wrist. And I don't have tiny hands. Uh, but I, I mean, I'm palm of basketball pretty easy, but uh, Dr. J's hands were just amazing and you can tell it he's had to um, graciously accept comments from fans over uh, many many years about the size of his hands and so he was really good about it and took a great picture with us and um, you know that was actually a great month we actually the week before or two weeks before so in Edmonton we had Jack Armstrong uh, from the Raptors yeah. broadcast uh, up in Edmonton and did a coaching clinic for us and got to have lunch with Jack. And so he was there as well and helped, you know, facilitate the introductions mm-hmm. and all those guys. And so it was a really, really awesome day to have that kind of close touch with, with the NBA and, and with a legend like Dr. J was, uh, was uh, pretty cool. Something I'll remember forever. That's, I mean, I guess that's what the guys get too for going to McDonald's and then you're exactly, the one you know, waiting an, there. An, or... an unhealthy choice. <laughs> yes. And look what happens as soon as they yeah. leave. Oh, we got Dr. J. Okay, let's go. Oh, yeah. it's just go. me. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I could have got VIP passes for 15 people. But, no. Uh, nevertheless, I'd like to pretend that we could have. And that's like really missed out on that opportunity. <laughs> and then now you can dangle that over them too for saying this is what happens when you eat 
McDonald's unhealthy, you miss opportunities to meet legends like this so don't <laughs> eat McDonald's all the time. Yes, that's, that's, that's always a direct correlation. Anytime mm-hmm. you go to McDonald's, means you're not going to meet the top no. 50 NBA player. So. No, I mean... <laughs> I actually, I actually had that like this week for the first time in a while, and I I understand why I didn't go for so long <laughs> because it just it does doesn't live up to what I don't know what I expected, but it wasn't that, and yeah. I guess that's why it's fast food. That's how yeah, they call yeah. it that. <laughs> Obviously, knowing and having played for Coach Sir and getting the call from him kind of helped push your coaching career along but for you whether when you took over the program on your own in 2012 or just that first year in coaching what what was kind of the biggest challenge for you in adjusting to the coaching lifestyle or the coaching I guess yeah lifestyle well again I'd kind of I'd been buying into it for a few years and I like I said before not rushing into it was, mm-hmm. was a big part of it. And taking over a team that you had been with for a long time was also very beneficial mm-hmm. and that you had familiarity with the guys. And it's not like, Hey, who's this random guy coming <laughs> to coach us. Um, so there was, there was already, a, you know, strong relationships built with the guys on the team. Mm-hmm. And so honestly, the transition was, was pretty smooth. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think there was anything that really was like, Oh man, I just, yeah, I can't believe that this is the, uh, I got to deal with this. Like, I, honestly, it was about as smooth of a transition as I think you can have. And so mm-hmm. I think that's part of why I've had less bumps in the road than maybe other guys <laughs> is that I did. I was fortunate to have that go out or roll out in a way that, um, that allowed me to be successful and, and continue to build on, mm-hmm. on what Coach Sir had built. And so, so yeah, I don't think there was I don't think there was anything that was just this huge challenge. I mean, there's the standard challenges of recruiting and right. retention right. and you know finding those right guys to continue to build your team. And yeah, but yeah, I don't think there was anything that was like you know devastatingly challenging to be yeah. honest. I guess that's always a good sign then if it's just yeah. kind of like you said you've been with the program for five years beforehand and then you kind of just step in and it's just kind of keeps the process going just everything kind of falls on you like you said instead of having a hand in it now you are the one kind of driving that bus and obviously more responsibility but you look at you mentioned kind of recruiting i'm going to kind of jump off track a bit you guys have had some talented players come through in your time and i think the one that i think will stand out to most people hopefully if they've paid attention which we'll get into afterwards i don't think many people watch ccaa or as they should but that's another rant for another day (laughs) it's ryan mclaren and the records that he set single season career at concordia with his career points single season single season points per game like you can go on and on for those who may not have seen him play just how good was Ryan? Ryan Ryan was deceptively good. Mm-hmm. I think that was the thing is you'd look you'd look at the box score at the end of the game and go he had twenty eight, and he was one of those guys that was a, with those silent assassins out on the floor mm-hmm. uh, because he didn't score that in flashy ways. He scored in in the simple, productive ways that allow someone to be very efficient out on the floor. He got to the free throw line a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one thing that he did well is, and that we tried to set up as much as possible is to get him into those mismatch situations. Whether if so you tried to guard him big, then he could use the speed that he had and his ability to take you off the dribble. And if you tried to guard him small, we'd put him in post-up situations and get him near the rim. And then you'd be forced to foul and, uh, and put him on the line where he was, you know, 85 to 90% mm-hmm. uh, at the free throw line. And so, uh, you know, in that final year, he led the country and made free throws. Uh, yeah. And again, he did it shooting at 90%. And so, again, that was a huge part of, of who he was. And and he was one of, if not the most quiet guy I've ever coached. I think <laughs> I maybe had more conversations with him since he's been done playing than he did while he was playing. Because he just, you know, he just showed up, did his job, and put the ball in the hoop and went home. <laughs> like, he, 
he wasn't uh, he wasn't flashy by any stretch of the imagination. And that's like I like some flash at times. It's fun to watch guys, you know, you know, get up, dunk the ball, get excited. Um, but he was never he was never going to be that guy. We were joking in kind of that near the end of his career that you know if he ever got the opportunity, because he could dunk quite easily, six six, he could dunk with mm-hmm. ease. But he just never got the runway. And and one of his final games, he got. A, as clear a runway as you could imagine and he the footsteps just just did not line up <laughs> it was one of the most awkward looking missed layups you've ever seen oh man. but uh you know even when he even when he tried to be flashy he couldn't uh, but just that solid steady consistent guy who uh, you know who could who could get it done and, he, and smart because he didn't say much i don't know if people appreciated how smart of a player he was too mm-hmm really crafty and really intelligent out there um, and again as with any as with any player still made mistakes at times but made uh, made a lot more great uh, plays than he did mistakes and that led him to be really successful and he made a lot of the shots you're supposed to make you're supposed to make your free throws. you're supposed to make your laps mm-hmm. you're supposed mm-hmm. to make your open threes yeah. and he he did those things you know as well as anybody we've ever had and again when you do it over five years the numbers are going to add up for you Mm-hmm. And uh, and the biggest thing too is you can say along with putting up numbers, we won games. Right. And any player will tell you as much as it's great to put up numbers, it's better to be on the right side of the the score at the end. Mm-hmm. And it's one thing we can say with Ryan is that, uh, that along with the stats, there were wins. Listening, listening to hear like how you kind of describe like his consistency and kind of just went about his business and making the free throws and like if you challenge him one way he'll beat you a different way and reminds me a little bit like cadre gray at laurentian and u sports just consistent on both ends can beat you with his speed if you challenge him big and hit his free throws to me it almost matches up obviously the height is going to be a little bit different but and then you had Ryan. He was a second team All Star once. He was a first team All Star twice. He was an All Canadian in his last year. It, the the accolades and the resume that he built in five years is incredible. It's it's. I think it kind of speaks for itself. Yeah, and again, from a from a guy that you know, two or three schools were interested in mm-hmm. coming out of high school. Because again, a lot of guys that you see end up in the CCAA. They have a flaw that you notice, mm-hmm. and Ryan's flaw is that his shooting form was a little bit weird. Yeah. He shot it from very low; it was kind of a push shot, um, especially when shooting from range. But anytime on the dribble pull up, you know, a post up fadeaway shot, pretty normal. But if you watch them just take a pull up, you know, in transition from three, you're gonna go, "That's weird looking," <laughs> and that's not right. But again, yeah. a low release for a guy that's six six is different than a low release for a guy that's five ten. Right. So he was still able to effectively get his shot off, uh, you know, when he needed to. But again, yeah, he had he had that kind of flaw that you could look at and go, well, yeah, he's a good player, but, and that's one thing that I think is a big part of coaching is going, yeah, there's a there's a but to a lot of guys. Mm-hmm. They're good, but or this this but it's finding a way to work with that but and make it part of you know part of how they can still be successful in spite of what might be a perceived flaw mm-hmm. and you you add in like after ryan you add in guys like ron bacon jr ryan coleman milos pirovic what do, what did these guys and others how have they kind of helped shape your program since you've been there and then now as you kind of transition to life uh without them with ron having graduated this year and everybody else yeah and it kind of gave like the, our, our Hall of Fame rundown of bigs there. Yeah. <laughs> um, along, you probably throw Jamal Buckner in that group yep. as well as as one of the first. And so we've always we've always been lucky to have a guy that's at six seven six eight, mm-hmm. um, fairly strong, mm-hmm. but fairly complete uh, player. Not just a guy that you would just throw down in the low post, right? Uh, and go. And so all of those guys were different. Um, but they all filled uh, a very similar role in that they were uh, they were leaders. Mm-hmm. They could score. They could play defense. Uh, they played with a lot of energy. Like I think Ron uh, again, man, I miss that guy. <laughs> not just not just because of the basketball player that he was, but because of the 
the energy and the personality um, that he had runs back home in Indianapolis right now. Mm -hmm. And he, mm -hmm. you know, the way that he would pump up and motivate his teammates with, with the energy that he brought, like his love of basketball and the, his gratitude for the opportunity to play showed. Cause again, his journey from, he started at Southern Indiana university, red shirting, not getting an opportunity for a couple of years, moving on to a junior college where again, still kind of limited opportunities in a place where they had about like 26 guys on the roster. Jesus. And so carving out minutes um, there actually Milos that you mentioned as well came from the same junior college that, uh, that Ron did mm -hmm. uh, Central mm -hmm. Lakes college in Minnesota. And, you know, when I looked at, when you try and find, well, okay, this, there's limited film, there's limited numbers. How can we, you know, how do we evaluate if this is the right guy for us to, to bring in? And, you know, they have those, those per 40 stats that are like, well, if this guy played more minutes, mm -hmm. he would be producing at a really high level. And when we brought Ron in, it, that was immediate. I mean, he, he made 43s in a semester, his first, his first semester with us. Like right. could, for a big man, could really shoot the ball right. along with giving you a, a dominating post presence and a guy that could really quarterback a defense, despite not being the most mobile, agile guy, was still very effective in his role at the defensive end of the floor. Um, and then we could run a lot of offense through him and created opportunities. I mean, the combination of him and Ryan that they played together for, for three years, mm -hmm. um, like he, the, their ability to create for one another and to offset each other's skill sets. Uh, I mean, you really had to pick your poison, I think, when you played us with those two guys on the floor. And yeah, so uh, again, Ron was, again, missed that guy a lot and, uh, and was doing well back home. But uh, yeah, so he, so again, the things that he did and, and the guy, you mentioned Ryan Coleman as well, who was, um, Coltrane as he would be affectionately known by many people. I mean, just a, just a motor that doesn't stop. And mm -hmm. I believe he led the country in rebounding in his year with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously moved up to mm -hmm. new sports. Uh, you know, when, you're, when you're that good, you find an opportunity at that level as well. And so, again, a guy who shot 90% from the free throw line, 60% from the floor. Um, but he did, he did the things that he needed to do well. Uh, mm -hmm. He didn't need to be that – um, diverse as a player because the things that he did well, nobody could stop that effectively. And so, uh, yeah, so again, a guy uh, who just played with that energy and that, that motor that, uh, that you long for. Play, but then you're six, seven and, you know, two fifteen and pretty strong mm -hmm. uh, made things really easy for him. So, yeah. So again, been very fortunate to, to always have a really good um, uh, big man that could stretch the floor. Fits, fits into and we were fits into and along with adapting offense to to fit around those guys skill sets you look at to be kind of touched on already you guys have two ACAC silvers one bronze you also made the school's first trip to nationals in 2014 at a quest what was that whole experience just like for you? as a coach, as a team, as a program, what was that whole kind of trip like for you? Well, I mean, it kind of started the real quickly back at the beginning of that year. We started that year with uh, 19 guys and we went to nationals with eight. <laughs> so if that gives you an idea of what kind of year it was between, uh, between academics and injuries, uh, a variety of other things that, came up we by the time we got to even to the ACAC playoffs we had to we were doing well we were higher up in the standings that year and Jamal Buckner he was coming off an Achilles tear and then had a, a bad groin injury with about five games left in the year and we lost our last five games heading into playoffs and so we went from I believe we were third in the standings down all the way to seven so we dropped hard in the standings that yeah. year and uh, Jamal got just healthy enough in time. We had to play our way into the ACAC tournament. We had a little different format back then. So mm -hmm. we had to win two games to get in. Uh, and then we had to play uh, a McEwen team who was really, really good. It was going to, and it was the last year for McEwen before they were moving up to youth sports. So they had really built a quality team uh, mm -hmm. there with Coach Magdens uh, at McEwen. 
And when we had played them, we had lost to them without Jamal uh, that year. And so they had never – in two years, they hadn't had to play us with Jamal in the lineup. And oh, really? so he was finally healthy. And we went into that quarterfinal game in Red Deer, and uh, and we found a way. <laughs> we we hit a Dallas right. Uh, I had a very vet. The thing with those eight guys left, five of them were in their fourth or fifth year. So we had a very mm. veteran group leading the way. And Dallas Wright hit a – we were down two. Uh, McEwen did a great job defending our inbound play, but we found a way to, to sneak it in. And, and Dallas hit a, a three with 0.5 seconds left to put us up one. Damn. And uh, pulled, off, pulled off the upset there. And next day we pulled off an upset against Lethbridge and then got to play – one of one of the best CCAA teams I've ever seen with Coach Clay's team there at Red Deer that year, uh, with what they had, and we gave them a heck of a battle in the final. The, earlier in the year, we'd lost to them by 25, mm-hmm. and we were down 25 after the first quarter. <laughs> so I think a lot of people thought we were just going to get hammered in that final, and we were actually up um, 12 to eight after the first quarter. We, we we brought them down to our level and and made them play a physical uh, grinded out game mm-hmm. and they were they were used to scoring 100 points a game and we were able to hold them to 67 the problem is we couldn't hit the broad side of a bar that day either <laughs> and we lost that game by five points and we, and we missed 12 free throws and so one thing that all you know again we talk about getting close and what things might prevent you from winning um, we had a bad day from the free throw line which was not atypical for our team that year unfortunately i think we shot about 60 percent as a team uh, we had to beat people with defense that year. And so we, we found a way to slow them up and give ourselves a chance. Um, so, again, a great battle there and uh, against Coach Pottinger and, and his squad there at Red Deer. And, and, again, the guys going out to Nationals, like I said, we had a bunch of fourth and fifth-year guys, so this was going to be their last run at it. And mm-hmm. they gave me everything they had. And uh, we went out there and we, we, got, we obviously drew the bottom seed uh, as the eighth seed going in. We had to play Langara with uh, Coach Ebe. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had Brody Gregg, mm-hmm. and Brody Gregg was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think anyone will argue with that. And so they, I mean, they obviously had a phenomenal team uh, there at Langara that year. And so we came up a little short against them, um, and then you know just in just got to enjoy that week and gave our some of our young guys along with a young coach and myself that taste of what it was like to get to that point, and. You know, one of the, one thing I'll never forget is the championship game from that year, uh, watching Red Deer go against Langara, and, and again a great battle. Red Deer was up going into the fourth. Langara makes a great charge to take the lead near the end and get up. And then what Lloyd Strickland did, hitting those four threes in 28 seconds. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you haven't seen that, look it up on YouTube. It's been clipped uh, many times. Is I mean, quite legendary. If you, if you want to see a phenomenal finish to a basketball game. Yeah. Watch, uh, watch Lloyd yeah. take those shots, and just hit them from all different spots, and just nothing but the bottom of the net. And, and uh, I, I will say for about two minutes, I was actually rooting for another CCW team, <laughs> um, pretty hard. I wanted to see them pull that off. And, right. Uh, um, and obviously, Coach, right. Coach Clay's a friend, and and you want to you want to see him do well. And man, it was uh, it was a heck of a finish. I'll always remember being in that gym for that game. Um, that gave that gave our guys a man. We'd like to be in that position. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, that's where you want to be. That's what you want to do. And so again, that's uh, that was a phenomenal experience. Quest was a great place to go. And got to take the guys up to Whistler for the day on our off day mm-hmm. uh, during the time. And you know, you get to you get to make a real special experience and special memories uh, from there. But uh, yeah, we uh, we ended up finishing in the seventh. We won the we won the seven eight game against uh, Crandall. Mm-hmm. Um, Again, it was a special day. I think Dallas, who I talked about earlier, I think he outscored Crandall by himself in the first half of that game. One of, those, one of those special days where Jeez. everything's going in. And I think it was it was going to be his last ever college game, mm-hmm. and for him to have that kind of special day was uh, was uh, pretty awesome. And so, yeah. he's just gonna so, yeah. So again, special experience. He was, he was just going to leave it all on the floor, regardless of what he had to do in that last game. Yeah, and that's and that's exactly what he did. So. We had uh, I had Coach Eve on here about a month ago, and I I kind of made him relive that final thirty seconds. And 
like just watching the video too. Like, I don't know how many times I watched it before that. And just he, whatever they threw at Strickland didn't matter because he hit those four threes. Like it was nothing like no yeah. hesitation. I think one was almost from the logo, like dead on. Yeah. It was there. A couple of them were pretty deep. A yeah. couple of them were pretty deep. And I just, yeah. the second or third time I went back and watched, I just kind of looked at Langara's bench just to watch coach Eberhardt's reactions. And he, at the end of it, he just, he didn't know what else to do. Like there was nothing else yeah. he could do. Like you throw the defense at him and he still found a way past. And like to be in that yeah. gym, well, like you said, would have been fantastic. Well, yeah, I think what some people forget too. Again, some people, the few, the few of us that would remember, <laughs> the day before in the semifinal, Langara was in jeopardy too. They mm-hmm. had, they were down at the end. And I, and again, when you're young and you're learning, you're watching these really experienced coaches work. You know, the some of the strategy that Coach Eve used. Uh, you know, he, they'd hit a shot. He'd have five guys up waiting at the table because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some of his starters are in foul trouble. And when they're playing, you're playing the foul game to extend uh, to extend the time and, and give yourselves more opportunities. And the way FIBA rules work, under two minutes, so you'd have those guys up there at the table waiting. He'd sub in five guys. They'd try and force a turnover or foul quick. And as they as they do that, then he'd sub the starters back. And he was just – he was working the, the strategy to perfection, and he found a way to pull his team through in a tough situation the day before. Mm-hmm. And you know, when you watch that the the tournament that year, I mean, they earned their win, and they, they earned that championship. And even the the first day too, people will forget Red Deer was down twenty to Crandall in the first day, and they found a way to come back. And so there were a lot of really good games and a lot of great coaching adjustments. And those who those those who found their way to the end and that being Coach Clay and Coach Eve, uh, they earned their way there. They were they were challenged by teams who were prepared for them and ready and gave them their best shot and they found a way to get uh, get to the top of the mountain there the pun intended being in, in, uh, in Squamish but uh, um, yeah they, they, they earned their way there and then mm-hmm. they gave everybody a phenomenal show in that yeah. so, uh, I think that's got to be it's got to be one of the better national championships in recent years at least like you said, with I would agree with the first day Red Deer, Langara the second day having to fight their way back, and then day three, I can only imagine Coach Eve on the bench thinking, "Okay, we came back from this yesterday, and oh lord, it's happening to us now. What do we do?" And yeah. they weathered the storm. I mean, Brody, like you said, Brody Gregg, he's really good at basketball. He hit mm-hmm. like nine of ten or ten of eleven free throws in that final thirty seconds to yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it was seven. It may have been seven of eight in that okay. seventh one that he missed, and and uh, I believe it was Clay Crellin got the rebound mm-hmm. and, and didn't get the ball to Lloyd. Tried to head it to someone else. It got tipped out of bounds, but it was still Red Deer possession. But uh, Clay had used his final timeout, so he didn't have another timeout to call uh, another play with that about one second left. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, he, I think if they had, I think everyone agrees if the ball had found its way to Lloyd, we'd be talking about Red Deer as champions instead of Langara yep. uh, in that moment because there was just no, there was just no way he was going to miss that fifth one if no. he had gotten the opportunity to shoot it. So there was a, there was a oh, yeah, lot of, no there was a lot of emotions in that final twenty eight seconds, and just watching yes. it back from like seven years ago or six years ago, I had a lot of emotions in the last. 30 seconds. I mean, this is crazy because I, I remember it, forgot about it and then watch it again. I'm like, Oh, okay. This, this is what happened. This was, this yeah. is why it made ESPN. This is why everybody grabbed it and ran with it because mm-hmm. that was one of the best 28 seconds shooting performance I've ever seen. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Looking kind of at you guys the last few years, and we mentioned the two silvers again, I haven't really been able to grab that elusive gold. What do you think is, what do you think has been like kind of the Achilles heel? I know Sate has dominated the South and then they've won four in a row. What do you think the hurdle, final hurdle for you guys to get over to get that gold? 
Well, if everyone else would decide just to not have a good team for a year, I'd really appreciate it. But <laughs> no, I, and again, sometimes that is the hurdle. Sometimes you can build a great team mm-hmm. and be right there, but somebody else has done the same thing and uh, you know, become good friends with, with Marty there at Sade over the years here too. And, and he's done a phenomenal job building a great team to win four in a row is, is remarkable. I mm-hmm. it's, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I, I wish I was in his shoes, uh, so to speak. Uh, but they, they've done a great job building a great team. And said so the year we played Red Deer in the final, Clay had built an absolute monster of a team. And everyone, everyone across the board, uh, whether it's the ACAC or any of the other conferences across the country, everybody works within different parameters at their own institution, whether it's mm-hmm. education, scholarship budgets, um, all kinds of different factors that can come into play requirements to get into your school. And so, you know, your job as a coach is to find the right guys that fit um, the criteria that you have to work with And so I think we've done a good job of finding guys that fit. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, like I said, some days, some days it just simple as making a couple more shots. Yeah. I don't think there's one thing in particular that, uh, that stands in our way. I and mean, we probably have some of the tougher academics. Uh, in the ACAC as being a four-year university mm-hmm. that has, uh, you know, that has some after degree and master's programs and, mm-hmm. and things. And that there's bonus, there's pluses to that too, is because we're not a two-year or a tech school where guys are in and out very quick, we do get the chance to have guys for four or five years quite often. And so there's benefits to, to building a team in that way. Um, but it also means sometimes you're starting with, with some younger guys, you're probably, you know, a little bit less in the transfer department of guys coming in and out and um but yeah so it's you know there's different ways to to build teams and there's certain elements that tend to do well if you have a little more age and experience uh in our league you tend to do well and we've tried to strike the right balance but at the same time still creating opportunity for young guys coming out of high school because if 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 the young guys coming out of high school just think they're coming into a league that's all 26 27 year olds it's always going to be tough for them to to find that, uh, that opportunity, but, uh, yeah, you know, you have to work within the work within the parameters that are, that are in front of you. And I don't think there's been one, one fatal flaw to what we've done. It's just mm-hmm. there's been some other good teams in our way. And, uh, sometimes you miss a couple of shots. Sometimes you have an off day. Right. And again, there's a, there's a large human element to, to what we do and we're never going to be perfect. And there's never, going to go exactly how you want it to go Um, because you know 15 teams in our league can't win every year because we'd all if that was the plan everyone would you know well we'd like to be champions this year (laughs) and it just that's just not the case and so uh, (laughs) it'd be nice it'd be nice uh, if it worked that way we'll never it'd be nice but yeah let's not get into the everybody needs a participation oh god no there's a reason that we have a trophy there's a reason we quest out we we quest after that thing and uh, i have no problem uh with there being one winner, because that's what there should be. 100%. And whoever earns it, earns it. And so for the last few years, they it's earned it. <laughs> so give them give them credit because they have earned it. And, we again, we had a great championship game with them uh, two years ago, and we played them in the first round this year, uh, this past season. And, mm-hmm. again, they, they came out on top of us in those two matchups. And, you know, credit to them for getting the job done. Mm-hmm. That's, you know, that's just the bottom line. At the end of the day, they had more points than we did. Okay. So. And it keeps coming back to like kind of what you said a few times over this is just control what you can and that's all you can do. Control your controllables and that's it. Exactly. Because that, again, that's all you can do. One last one be kind, before we kind of wrap it up and ask the last question I ask everybody. Uh, what excites you about the future of your program? with the guys you've got in the gym now and the talent you have coming in and coming back, what excites you about the future of the Thunder program? Well, so many, so many things. Um, the fact that I get to continue to do it excites me. That's, <laughs> um, that's, that's a big part of it. And you know that, I mean, obviously this year is going to be, going to be very different. Um, but what excites me is that is the opportunity to work with, with some of these young guys we we're probably a little faster, maybe a touch smaller than we've been in the past, but I think we're quicker. I think we shoot the ball well. 
I'm excited to, to continue to build around that and continue to add pieces. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, the likelihood is, is, you know, probably won't see us until 2021. That's, that's just the reality of, uh, of what we're, what we're dealing with. And so getting a chance to develop the guys that we brought in this year and, you know, again, looking, looking at the bright side of this is you get a whole year to work with players to prepare and develop them for their, uh, for, for a season. And so I think of how good we can be with a full year of training practice, the guys in the weight room, getting, you know, getting them on nutrition. We get all, th- all kinds of different things that we can do to help these guys prepare. And so, uh, I mean, obviously we're, uh, we're doing those things in, in the parameters that we have to work within right now. And so we'll just continue to do that and prepare for whenever they tell us that next game is. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's just what we'll do. Like, I love coaching. I love being in the gym and, you know, you take great pride and have great joy in, in seeing guys achieve success and get better. And I look forward to doing that for the next, however many months that we have to do it this way. And so we'll just keep uh, progressing and pushing. And, uh, and again, I hope other programs around the country start to open up more and get those same opportunities to, to work with their players because what becomes very evident in times like this is that, you know, we're all just people, whether we're basketball players and coaches, and this is something that basketball players and coaches love to do. They love to be in the gym. They love to work on their game and improve their craft. And I hope that more and more people are finding that opportunity and finding it in a safe way and in the right way as we navigate through, uh, through this pandemic it's like every day every day is changing every day is every hour it feels like something's shifting something's changing so like i give full credit to the acac pac west the acaa uh quebec too for having that patience to find a way to make a decision that's going to help keep everybody safe most importantly but also kind of look at how we can make this happen because I feel like sports and these outlets are so key to mental health and of the athletes and coaches, whoever, it's kind of that distraction from whatever they have else going on in life. And it kind of, it's their, almost their escape to in a sense as well. So I full credit to those four leagues that have kind of exercised that bit of extra patience to try and find the best way possible to keep everybody safe but also have that kind of normalcy and outlet I guess to kind of keep that mental health piece as a focus as well yeah and again maybe maybe it is just delaying the inevitable uh, or that might, yeah, yeah, leagues leagues may not happen mm-hmm. and that's just what we're dealing with and <laughs> It's our job as coaches to, to make the absolute best uh, opportunity that we can for our players right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for some coaches right now, it's Zoom calls. <laughs> for right. other coaches, right. it's, you know, limited skill work in the gym. For some of us to get a little bit more right now, you know, we, we're grateful for it and we'll, we'll take what we can get to, uh, to continue to work with our players. Because like I said, the, the mental health aspect of it, along with the physical aspect, mm-hmm health aspect is it's huge and and uh creating those opportunities right now i think is vitally important and again there's as we as we see with what the canadian government's doing and hopefully rapid testing becomes more of a, a prevalent option and hopefully vaccines continue to progress down the right road and that we get those things sooner than later that can that can bring a bring an end to this as soon as possible for everybody right that would be That'd be nice. That'd be nice. I'd yeah, be nice. like to get back to some sort of normal soon, but I'm also not a big fan of crowds, so I'm okay with people staying inside. So this is kind of nice. I don't, don't mind this part of it, so that's okay. Yeah. Well, the only time I like crowds is Fridays and Saturday nights. So right, in the gym. I, mm-hmm. I feel the same way. I know. In, the gym, on, in the gym for a game, that's a great time to have a crowd. Other than that, I feel the same way. Yeah. Uh, Fifteen thousand massive, dear person, massive bodies at a concert or something. That's not my, not my cup of tea either. 
people can continue to stay six feet away from me when this is all said and done, that would be fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, just keep that. Like, I don't even go to, I don't even like going to Costco because it's too busy. It's no. like, just, no, I'm okay. My wife goes, no. that's fine. <laughs> Well, you're only, I know our rules. You're only supposed to have one person from the household doing those kind right. of things. So she's your, you, she's your designated survivor. Then, uh, then she's, uh, she's out she, there getting the job done for you. And they, they stopped the samples. So I don't see a point in going to Costco anymore. Anyways, well, so. there you go. If you can't get the samples at Costco, there is no point. I'm not waiting in line for whatsoever. nothing at this point. <laughs> well, they, they do have the cheap hot dogs. That's true. And, uh, if we're going to, if they're going to be some bad indulgences on that junk food we've been talking about, but, uh, yeah, you do get the Costco hot dog. That's always a nice touch. In the That's true. I can, I can forego those if she wants to go brave crowds because to me, at the end of the day, I just want to get out. I don't want to have the wait in line for the food because then people just pack in even more and I'm already fed up by that point. So, yeah. couple of hard hitting ones to before we get into the last deep one that we've tended to ask everybody on these. All right. Speaking of food, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? I know I'm going to be in the minority. I like it. I like a Hawaiian okay. pizza. I do. I'm, I'm with um, you on that one. I think I, you've got to kind of almost be in like the right mood for it. I wouldn't order it every, like every time, but I'm oh, definitely not, sure. gonna, not going to turn down a, a Hawaiian pizza or like a pineapple with like a spicy pepper or something. I mean, people will say fruit doesn't belong on pizza and I don't want to get into the whole science of it here, but tomatoes are fruit people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's tomato sauce. People put fire roasted tomatoes on their pizza. People like, you know, like that's, uh, let's, let's, let's remember fruit, fruit is an essential part of pizza. So it's the, it's the base <laughs> of almost every pizza. So exactly. So it's, uh, it's not a debate when it's really a fact. So, I mean, and, just, and Hawaiian, can... Hawaiian pizza is a Canadian invention. So, that so is true. Canucks here, we have to. I think we need to embrace what, uh, what we've created. So pineapple, yes, and pineapple, then yes. now with the Lakers winning the title, the debate I find has heated up on LeBron and Jordan. Wow, well, I mean, it's a it's a no brainer for me, mm -hmm. and it's Michael Jordan. Okay. And, uh, I appreciate LeBron's greatness. Mm -hmm. I appreciate what he's done. But, you know, I, I think too, you know, we can get, in, you can get into all the statistical stuff and everything, but for those of us of a certain age, mm -hmm. Michael Jordan was the one who made us fall in love with basketball. Mm -hmm. You know, like when Michael Jordan won his first title, I'm eight years old, and I'm just starting to play basketball competitively. Okay. So I mean, okay. who do you think I'm going to gravitate towards? I mean, LeBron does so many incredible things out on the court. It's not to, I, I don't want the debate to be to diminish what LeBron does. Um, but for me, the, the Jordan will always be the goat. And, you know, he, there's so many things you can, everyone can point at. I mean, Jordan did go undefeated in the finals. He was the MVP every time he was in the finals. Yeah. Did, he had two three-peats. You know, those are all things LeBron hasn't done. However, Jordan didn't go to 10 finals and with three different teams. Right. And, like, so however you want to shape that narrative, you can shape it to favor one or the other. And I think ultimately it's going to be a, a personal choice. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I, but I have strong feelings that for me it will always be Michael Jordan. Yeah. I, uh, I can see it from both sides, and I can see why the – the slightly younger generation would gravitate towards LeBron because again, that's really all they've seen. That's all they've known, but they've got to watch the last dance. I mean, everybody watched it in quarantine. Yeah. So everybody knows what Michael did over his career and for them to come out of it and still say LeBron, I mean, you're entitled to your own opinion, even mm -hmm. if it's the wrong one. Yeah, I mean, there's there's that recency bias with LeBron. There's also right. the nostalgic bias with with right. uh, with Jordan. And I think one of our huge saving graces through this lockdown and quarantine was the Last Dance. I know for the oh, basketball uh, community, man, did I love that. And have has it been rewatched several times? Yes, it has. Um, and will it continue to be rewatched several times? Yes, it yes, will. It will. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in this household. So it. Uh, 
yeah, it, it was so good to relive that mm-hmm. in a lot of ways and learn some new things. And, and one thing, I, again, I would, when we were doing our, our Zoom calls with our team over the summer, I would talk to the guys about, you know, have you watched this week's episodes and what, are you, what did you learn from it? And one big takeaway for me is that that, that friction is good. And mm-hmm. that some greatness can come out of it. It's okay not to be the nice guy all the time. And you need to be as, as what some might say it was over the top with it as Jordan was. Well, that's, that's a debate you can have, yep. but did he push some guys that maybe weren't as, uh, weren't as good as they ended up being to be that? Mm-hmm. Like is Scotty Pippen, Scotty Pippen without Michael Jordan? Like mm-hmm. if you have Scotty Pippen or as they reference in there in the draft, Scott Pippen, which was <laughs> pure comedy when it's like, I wonder the last time he's been called Scott yeah. Um, yeah. When, when he was, you know, and again, obviously we knew it was a planned draft day trade with the Sonics there, but mm-hmm. if he had just gone to the Sonics, would he have been, would we be talking about him in the same context that we talk about him? Right. Would he, right. would he have six titles? Would he have been on the dream team? Would he have, all the accolades that he has as a player and deservedly so because of what he accomplished in his career with the bulls. Would he have had all those things without Michael Jordan, you know, pulling him along Mm -hmm. and vice versa. Michael Jordan said, you can't talk Michael Jordan without talking stuff. Right. And so to, for Jordan to give credit to Scotty in that way, which some Jordan doesn't do a ton of, Mm -hmm. um, even though, you could argue that Scotty was thrown under the bus a little bit in the, in the last dance. There was, there was some moments. There were some moments there that I'm pretty sure that uh, Scotty wishes weren't emphasized throughout that documentary. But you know, and yep. could they have made a different choice there in the edit and the editing room? Sure, but they chose to portray it in a particular way. Mm-hmm. Um, so so you know, you can make that argument about Jordan. Jordan motivated guys on his team maybe differently than LeBron motivates guys yeah. you know on his teams you know and lebron's drugged some guys along to some championships that uh you know like i mean jr smith's got some rings and i don't think uh i don't think people are going you know jr smith would have won this without him oh yeah um, no Dwight not howard Dwight howard you would not have a ring without uh no you know without lebron um, not even close yeah. you know and a part of the lebron narrative too of you know he's his influence over the game is and the ability to influence the game at all levels in the fact that he basically runs an agency where he has an agent finding ways to help build the Lakers roster in ways that, uh, you know, Michael Jordan did not have when he right. was playing. I mean, you had, you, had uh, you know, Krause building the Bulls the way that he wanted to build. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, I'm sure they didn't give two hoots what a lot of people thought about uh, their no. thing. Nor were guys asking out of, particular teams to end up somewhere, you know, mm-hmm. you know, cause let's be honest, the Lakers without AD did not make the playoffs. No. The Lakers with AD no. win a championship. Yep. And so, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you know, this, is this champion, like this is this championship as much about LeBron as it is about Anthony Davis. And there's all kinds of different arguments you can make on that subject. Mm-hmm. But again, LeBron is a phenomenal player that I enjoy watching play because he plays the game really, really well. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, that's still never not going to move me off my off my position. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't really. I don't mind LeBron. I, I we hear about him all the time. Like it's all it is. It's LeBron this, LeBron that. It's the same reason why I don't. I don't like Tiger Woods at all because that's all you saw for years. But if LeBron James ruins Space Jam, that's it. Well, uh, have, have you seen have you seen the release? They have released what the plot's going to be. It's out there. Mm-hmm. They have they have said what the story's going to be, and uh, he he may he may be ruining it. So it's it's one of those things. Don't mess with the classic. Number one was fine. It was like rewatched. I don't know how many times. You don't yeah. mess with, don't mess with a good thing, and that was a great thing. Yeah, and it's not. It's yeah, it's one of those ones that didn't need a it didn't need a follow up. No. I, I look back at the great like things like Dumb and Dumber and mm-hmm. Anchorman and other films you grow like and then eventually enough public pressure got them to make another one mm-hmm. and it's like ah, we didn't need this no you know let's just let let's just let the original live in uh, live in its glory and appreciate it for what it was instead of trying to recreate that magic mm-hmm. which, which Hollywood 
tends to do quite often, unfortunately. I'm going to I'm going to go in with an open mind, but Oh, it's not like I'm not going to see it. Of course I'm going to see it. I've only <laughs> I've only ever walked out of one movie, and if this goes bad, this may be the second <laughs> because I don't want to watch the train wreck. I want to have the memories of one ready to go and I don't want to ruin it with the rest of two. Yeah. So, we'll, well see, see what I happens. mean, it's funny you bring up train wreck. There's a good LeBron movie. LeBron was actually pretty funny in Trainwreck. That's true. That is true. Like, I'll get, I'll get, he, he did show the acting chops uh, quite well. I thought his, I thought his, almost his spoof of himself a little bit in that was, was yeah. pretty funny. So. It was a good, good side of LeBron to see. A little bit of comedic humor. But yeah, in an animated movie, I don't know how this is going to go. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I, I think we, we may find out because I don't think anyone's ever going to accuse Michael Jordan of being a good actor. Oh, God, no. That's not, uh, that's not what made Space Jam good. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you can debate whether Space Jam's actually good at all, but it was, it was, you know, for us again for a certain generation, mm-hmm. it would be something we always reflect back on. And LeBron very well, very well, may be a better screen actor than uh, than Jordan was. But that might be his one. Not what we care about. That'll be his one up on Jordan one is <laughs> acting the Space Jam. Yes. Last one for you before we yeah. wrap it up, and it's one we ask everybody at the end. And we touched on it before with not a lot of people really watching CCAA, U Sports as a whole. How do we keep, how do we get more people paying attention to men's basketball in Canada and just collegiate university as a whole? As a coach, you've seen it since you started at Concordia 12, 13 years ago. What would you, what do you want to see done to try to get that level of, kind of respect, admiration, and overall attention around the game to where it needs and should be, essentially? Well, I think, uh, you know, in being able to reflect on, you know, a decade and a half almost of, of being involved in it, that so many steps have been taken in the right direction. Mm-hmm. When we first started, um, filming games wasn't even mandatory. Right. Let, just for coaches' purposes, let alone for the purposes of broadcast and mm-hmm. uh, the ability to share uh, on social media, because social media wasn't a thing when I first started. Like Facebook had just kind of, sort of emerged mm-hmm. as, hey, this is a thing. And now with the accessibility to anything you want to have access to, mm-hmm. you know, we we carry these phones around with us that we can look up anything anytime. Right. If you want to. Um, so, so many things have been done in the right direction. The fact that there's online broadcasts of every game, that mm-hmm. there's uh, strong social media presences from a lot of programs. Uh, obviously, yourself with what you're doing with Four Quarters has elevated that to a level that we haven't had before, where there's a, a national hub, so to speak, where mm-hmm. all of this kind of comes together. Um, you know, I reflect back on going to games as as a kid when we go watch the U of A Golden Bears mm-hmm. and we go watch some of those great teams that they had in the 90s um, and growing up and playing. And I remember guys would we would get like a Greg DeVries that was a phenomenal player for them, ended up being a student teacher at my junior high. And so we mm-hmm. got to have mm-hmm. Greg DeVries come in and, and coach us a little bit. And we were like, oh, man, this guy is – and these guys were – these guys were kind of legends back then, whereas now I don't think um, that they get that same treatment. And as, much, as great as our Savile Center is in Edmonton, that old U of A gym, they used to pack it. If you weren't there by halftime of the women's game, you didn't get a seat. Like they were turning people away at the doors. Really? And it, it was it was a different time, but it, it was the only show in town. Like back then, Concordia was a school, but it didn't have basketball. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the ACAC existed, but I – I barely knew about it growing up, honestly. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. fact that it's now way more prevalent, it's it's trending in the right direction. I think it's always going to be a bit of a slow slow burn to get to where we want to get to mm-hmm. because we're not hockey. And we know that a lot of the driver of the of the sports media in this country is hockey. But as as we just all continue to to trumpet and champion the the things that uh, players, coaches are doing around the country uh, it's helpful and, and let's be honest the raptors having success has done a mm-hmm. lot for the game of basketball in our country mm-hmm. too like think about what were people talking about 
from April to kind of July last year. Like there was still that hangover even after the Raptors won. People were talking about the Raptors, the random comments, things people that you would never have assumed, you know, would would talk about basketball. We're talking about basketball. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was getting that national attention on TSN, on Sportsnet, uh, and everything that, that you needed it to get for people to go, hey, basketball is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and then to see that championship parade where, like, you know, oh. Again, that's that's not happening anytime soon. Not because the Raptors didn't win, because we're not going to be in crowds like that anytime <laughs> soon. But you think about that as a, a mass gathering of hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of people celebrating uh, a basketball championship. Right. right. And the, I mean, the media circus that surrounded. Will Kawhi stay? Will Kawhi go? I think anyone with half a brain knew he was never going to stay. Oh, 100 percent. He was gone. He was like gone that. before the year started. He, yeah, he, but. Give the guy credit; he still gave enough of an effort to win a championship, and mm -hmm. and it does take a pretty significant effort to win a championship. Oh, so one hundred percent. You know, say say what you want about him for that year; he did give them enough. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but yeah, so you know, I don't think there's anything specific; just the continual uh, grind and push that that uh, yourself and so many others are making. You know, in the coaching and playing world, to just Hey, 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 here we are. Here's what we do. And it's good. Mm -hmm. And it's something that there's a there's a there's a purity to it too. If you don't like a lot of the the overblown crap as <laughs> and you know the the LeBron mm -hmm. machine that is the NBA and all these other things, if you just want some pure basketball and love of the game, mm -hmm. those of us that, that work in this, we, we are not doing this to get rich. We are doing this because right. we love to do it. And so if that's something that you like and that's something that you like about sports, the CCAA and U sports are a great place for you because there are genuine people doing their job in a genuine way that just love to do this mm -hmm. do it because it's, they're passionate about it. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, we have to trumpet that that's what we're about is that these are people that just love doing this mm -hmm. and yeah, it deserves more attention. Absolutely. And again, we'll all just continue to grind and chip away at it. To, to get it there so I think I think one of the biggest things at least that I've noticed is when the season's on there there's conversations there's kind of people are you know if you're local you're going to maybe go to a local game but there's really no national attention until maybe national championships roll around and then as soon as middle of March is gone the conversation kind of stops and then nobody really pays attention until October again. And it's kind of, you lose a six month window. Mm -hmm. And now with three leagues already being canceled for the year, there's another three, four that are still kind of up in the air. We're going to have an 18 month window essentially with no games. And I think now is the time to really keep that conversation going for the lack of better explanation because if you didn't watch it a year and a half ago or a year ago when there's six months or whatever the time is now because it all blends together by the time games return if you didn't watch it 18 months ago are you going to really pick it up in October of 2021 or are you you're basically starting over Essentially, yeah. well, may, well may, I think that, I think there's a lot of factors that can play into that. Mm -hmm. Is maybe maybe that might be the time where people can actually come back to games in mass. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's how long we're looking at before people are, you know, before we got the butts in the seats. Right. And maybe right. people will be so starved for something. That's that what it I'm does hoping. create that. That could, it could create that opportunity as well. But it also it could fade into the background as well with people. Mm -hmm. I, an example I would point to is what the CEBL accomplished this summer. Mm -hmm. with their bubble and i know that college leagues can't operate in a bubble right. that's just that's unrealistic between academics and travel. like i know that's not a realistic possibility so mm -hmm. not saying hey we should all every athlete in the acac should get together and you know we'll, we'll pick a school and we'll all live in their dorms and we'll you know <laughs> as great as that would be, that would as, be wild as, as wild as you know as fun as that would be mm -hmm. i know that's not a realistic possibility we don't have the the, uh, the financial resources to make that happen but i think for a, for a nice window this summer, mm -hmm. the CEBL product was front and center. CBC was starved for content. They're like, hey, we'll pick up some games. 
Mm -hmm. We'll put you guys on the air. And they, there was more coverage and more eyes put on that product than they would have gotten had their season been normal in a normal year. Right. And so they, fed, they, they took the opportunity to say, we can do this safely. We can do this uh, in a bubble. We can do this in a way that will allow us to continue and survive. Because again, after one year, if they had sat out a year, they, they, their you know, continuation and existence of their league would have probably been in general. Mm -hmm. You know, one would think. And they found a way to put their product out there and get eyes on it. And I think that will bode very well for them going forward because I'm sure they were at a real critical point. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they found a way to do that. And again, if you watch any of those, there were some phenomenal players. I mean, obviously us in Edmonton were, uh, for those of us that cared are celebrating that championship <laughs> with the stickers. But, you know, to see, again, a local guy like Jordan Baker star and do the job that he did for the Stingers, mm -hmm. and then uh, Xavier Moon. If you hadn't seen Xavier play, you should see Xavier play. Mm -hmm. That guy is a heck of a ball player. You should be watching him. Uh, Travis Daniels, big man on their team as well. Like uh, Matthew Kamba, another Alberta guy. Like, man, there was some great imports, but there was also some great Canadian content on that team. And they've championed Canadian basketball by putting the limits that they've put on those rosters and making sure mm -hmm. that that U Sports and and hopefully as we progress, some CCAA players work towards opportunities in that league but they uh yeah if you haven't watched it you should watch it and they tried the elam ending out they did things to to uh to put a little spin on it and like the elam ending's kind of cool like you know should it be something a league adopts for 82 games a year probably not but is there places time and place for it absolutely mm -hmm. it's a cool thing yeah. so so yeah yeah I, I can see i can see canadian collegiate and university kind of go in that one of two ways. Like either it's going to be, you're going to be starved for it when it comes back. And then if we were able to have fans, like hopefully most gyms are packed with people and it may trickle down. Like as the year goes on, those crowds may kind of thin out a little bit, but I hope that if people get in, in October or whenever they can, they stay throughout the year. I, I just, I hope it doesn't come to the other side of it where they just, forget about it altogether for a year and a half and then any momentum that schools had last year is essentially gone and now everybody's starting fresh to try and get those fans engaged the kids in the gym to watch and kind of look up to these athletes and I just think like from now until then is huge to keep people paying attention and hopefully more people do it because I know SIDs are doing what they can to get people mm -hmm. talking about things. And it's hard because when there's no sports to talk about, you're just reliving old things. And yeah, that, and some schools don't have their SIDs right now. Exactly. Because they're not, because their athletics are on pause. Those guys, yep. with their, their responsibilities and on campus have been shifted to other things or some may have been laid off or something. Yep. There could be all kinds of different situations that those, mm -hmm. those people whose their job is to help facilitate the conversation just aren't able to do it right now so my like that was me last year and now mine's kind of shifted to something different like more on campus student life events just because yeah. there are no sports and most of your times with that so your athletics is taking a hit with the eyeballs because you're focused on other things and replaying old events and whatever old photos or whatever is going to get you run out of it after a while or it gets stale and I, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. I, I really think it is. And I think I don't want to, again, I said it last time too. I don't want to sound douchey, but <laughs> there's no, we need more people to talk about it. And I think CCAA in particular, there really isn't any conversation outside of SIDs and local papers and with no sports, local papers aren't covering it because there's nothing to cover. So the conversation is essentially stopped at a lot of schools when it's on pause. That's the part I think that concerns me the most is then when the CCAA comes back, where, like, what's the coverage going to kind of look like and how much are people going to know about the athletes that are back because they didn't talk about it for a year and a half. Yeah. And you're, you're I think bang on of just keeping the conversation going. I think that's the right message. And, and I know, I know there's enough, I know there's enough great coaches around the country 
and players that are invested to, to do that. And so whether it's just us in our own uh, our own communities and amongst our you know our CCAA family and then within each of our conferences that that the conversation will continue. Mm -hmm. Even when I put up a few things about our little inner squad scrimmage, the number of coaches that I heard from, mm -hmm. I'm just hey, awesome to see you guys doing that. Looks awesome. Looks like you guys are having a great time. Like you know, there was there was at least 15 people that reached out to just say hey, awesome. Happy yeah. to see you guys doing yeah. it. Like yeah. and that's that's just from a couple little Instagram stories. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, I just not like I have some massive following on social media. And I don't <laughs> care either way whether I do or not. But yeah, uh, just the fact. But again, but that's other CCAA coaches or U Sports coaches mm -hmm. just reaching out and going, you know, hey, looks like fun or jealous or whatever, <laughs> whatever the comments may have been um, at the time. And like I said, you see other programs doing it right now as well. I know Coach Joe out there at Fraser Valley in his first year has uh, mm -hmm. had a couple mm -hmm. inter squads as well and and uh, having a good time doing that. And, and again, we have to make the absolute best of this yep. within the parameters that we have to work with right now. Yep. And he just, like you said before, control the controllables, control what you can, and the rest is going to hopefully fall into place sooner than later to get some sort of season here in January. Fingers crossed. Like I'm hoping. No, it's and again, I, I hope it. I hope it's able to include as many people as possible mm -hmm. safely and and, yep. and for those for those who will be able to play, you know, will be there supporting mm -hmm. and and, uh, and uh, cheering it along and, and hoping. And again, fingers crossed that it goes well, yeah. that there isn't an issue with um, with COVID and, and basketball in right. particular. Was there anything else we missed that you wanted to add on the program, on what you've got going on? Anything else you want to add at the end? I'll kind of leave the last little bit to you. No, no. I think we, we covered a lot of stuff. It was It's always fun to go down memory lane a little bit mm -hmm. and, uh, and rehash some of those good times and talk right. about guys that, uh, that have meant a lot uh, to your program. There's so many. I mean, you always feel bad when you don't mention more guys because there's so many – players and assistant coaches and opposing coaches and players like mm -hmm. so many guys that have touched your career as a coach and your program that, uh, that you'll always be grateful for. And, and uh, yeah, so again, to, to all the guys that have ever played for me and coached with, uh, this is, uh, you know, whether you're here now or you've been past, we miss you. And we, uh, we hope that you're doing well. We hope everybody's staying safe and healthy out there. And uh, everyone, just please continue to do a good job of, of uh, getting this getting this pandemic under control so that we can play some basketball. Yes, because, yes. Uh, because yes. we we need it. So I, mean, I hope that's a message to anyone that listens to to be responsible, to be smart, uh, to take necessary precautions when you need to, and to exercise common sense out there so that we can uh, we can get back to this because we because we we need it. 100 percent yeah use your common sense wear your mask if you're out and just do your part to keep everyone else safe so we can get back to normal and get basketball back in gyms please please that's all i gotta say well coach i want to thank you for doing this i know i was one of those people that reached out on instagram in response to your videos so happy to that we were able to make this happen on short notice uh, but again, I want to thank you for doing this and any time you or some of your guys want to jump on or anything we can do for Thunder basketball, by all means, you know, you know how to get a hold of me and we'll make it happen for you. Appreciate it, man. And again, keep doing what you're doing. You do such a great job with this. So uh, keep continuing the conversation and, uh, and we'll be here to support you along the way, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tyler.